Soil School on realagriculture.com is brought to you by the Ontario Soil Network and the Mosaic Company. Welcome to the Soil School, I'm Bernard Tobin. Today I'm down in the Niagara Peninsula with Larry Dick from Camden Grain, right here in Camden, Ontario. Larry, how's it going? It's going really well, Bernard. Awesome. Hey, thanks for the invite. We're going to talk soil health, soil philosophy, with uh, you know how, how you manage the soil on this farm. But before that, give us a snapshot of the operation. Sure. I farm here together with my son, Ben. Uh, we farm a really heavy clay soil, both above and below the escarpment, fairly spread out. A lot of it's in really sensitive areas around vineyards. And so we farm corn, soybeans, and wheat. Uh, those are the main rotation crops, but we've also got some dry edible beans, azuki specifically, and buckwheat, and then cover crops. Well, a little bit of a lot, shall we say. Hey, let's talk about um, your goals and your objectives. So what are you trying to uh, achieve with your soil here? We're really trying to make a tough soil a little less tough and hopefully build a little more resiliency into it. It will always be a clay soil. It will never be a Huron-Perth loam, but maybe we can manage it a yeah, little and, differently. And with things like plant grain, you, you, you believe you can actually maintain yields as well, make it more resilient and set yourself up. Going That's forward. the hope. That's the hope. Uh, and so far, uh, we are finding that. Yeah. Now cover crops, no-till, um, something you've started, you've been doing a long time on this farm. Tell us about that. Well, we've been no-tilling beans and wheat since the mid-90s. We played with no-till corn back in the late 80s and learned some expensive lessons and so backed right off of that. Moved into a tillage program for the corn, so one year in three, but we were really scaling that back and always, always looking to see if there was another way of doing it. Uh, these farms prior to 1940, 1950 would all have been half in forage and, and we knew that if we could somehow introduce forages back in the rotation, but for us the logistics of making hay or grazing cattle weren't feasible. Mm. And so, you know, what could we do? And that brought us to the cover crop journey. Exactly, and it also brings you to a, a, a lot of industry meetings where you've, where you've listened to, and we've all talked about and listened to uh, experts like Lee Breeze and uh, Ray Archuleta, talking about, you know, obviously plant green and covering our ground and it taking about six to ten years for that type of a philosophy to sort of to really take hold in your farm. Um, Larry you're in year five, year six, how are you doing? I think we're doing okay. Uh, I say that carefully because uh, there's still a lot of lessons to learn and and we've learned way more lessons than I thought we would have to but but I, I think we're doing okay. I'm, I'm thrilled to see a nice corn crop behind me. Uh, it's dry and I can't control the rain. Yeah, but, but let's, talk, let's talk about this corn crop because this is planted green um, this spring into a cover crop which was burned down I think the same day. Talk about your philosophy um, and how this has come together. It looks awesome. Sure. Uh, so yes, we're, we look for, for a cover crop in the springtime of, of legumes, hairy vetch, crimson clover and some turnips. Uh, we plant and then as soon as we've planted, as soon as we can, we burn it off. But because I farm in such sensitive areas, it's related to wind and, and sometimes we get held back. But yes, we don't, we don't burn off until we plant. Because when we've got a green cover crop, the, the planter plants through it beautifully. If it's dead or dying, it's stringy and then you get hairpinning issues. Right. Now, Larry, you planted 31,000 seeds in this field into that cover crop. You got about a stand of about 27,000. That's pretty nice. Talk about what the success factors are of planting corn into that green. We've really found that every detail on the corn planter matters. Every detail. We've had to change gauge wheels. We've had to change closing wheels. We've had to change how we drop fertilizer. All of those details really matter. One of the biggest things that we've found is we've got to be deep enough. On our clay soils, when we were conventionally tilling, we were always uncomfortable planting deeper than an inch and three quarter because of crusting. Under a heavy green mat, we don't have crusting issues. And so we've discovered that we can push the seeds to two, two and a quarter, two and a half, and they're gonna come up. Because one of the realities is that when we're in a heavily rooted mass, the top three quarters of an inch may not stitch shut. It'll be closed, but it won't be stitched shut. But below that, 
below that three quarters of an inch inch, the earth is crumbly and everything is closed. So we've got to get down there. But on our clay soils, that can be a challenge, yeah. getting the planters down there. What about moisture? Obviously going in, a lot of fear of sometimes of whether that, that, that ground's going to dry out. How, how have you done in the last five years? Absolutely, it's critical that for us on our clay soils, when the field is ready, we plant. I realize there's lots of soils in the province where it might be ready to plant already April 5, but for calendar, they hold off. So that's a different scenario, and, and I'm not familiar with that. So then it might call for terminating the cover early, or, or st if you want to plant green, stunt it. There's ways of doing that. Um, but on our soils, as soon as the fields are ready, we plant. But it might be May 25. Yeah. You talked about, um, before we came on the camera, about, hey, you know, Bern, it really comes down to engineering and agronomics. And, sure. and you think you got a pretty good handle on the agronomics <laughs> when it comes to planting green. Well, I don't know if we have a good handle, but we ha I had to figure out really quick, we had some stellar failures, and I had to figure out whether it was agronomic, as in something we have no control over, or was it engineering? Something that I could change, had messed up on, should do differently. And... And as long as it was an engineering challenge that we could change, then I couldn't fault the plant green system. Until we have done everything in our power, then we can begin to analyze the system. Yeah. Now you're six years yes. into this approach, into this strategy. Talk about your soil, how it has changed, what you're seeing, what's the difference, um, obviously on a, a 10 year journey, shall we say. It's really hard to see a difference. It's still clay. Mm. I, I guess the biggest thing for me and the way to define a success for now is be can we grow good crops doing this? If we can, and, and we're getting there, uh, if we can grow good crops then I don't see a reason to go back. Mm. And so the yields are our report card. Yeah, and Obviously, we'll get some. Hopefully, we'll get some rain, like a lot of other farmers are hoping. But uh, this looks pretty solid. So, Larry, final question, and that is, you know, for for growers and farmers watching them, I mean, what can they learn from what you've learned in six years with this approach on your farm? Probably the the biggest the thought process that most impacts me is that the soil isn't a medium that we can manipulate. It's a living, breathing organism, and how I farm impacts that, and that just raises all the questions about everything we do. And it, it's forced us to rethink everything. So details matter, but the reality is the soil is a living, breathing organism. And how do we farm with that? Yeah, and it's a question every farmer should ask, right? Sure. Awesome, awesome. Hey, I'm gonna ask a question for you. Um, you're six years into your journey, 10 years. Can I come back in four and we'll have another chat? Absolutely. I have no idea what we'll be doing because it's a learning process. Awesome. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Bernard.